So let me first give a shout out to the students from Newark. I thought, I'm, I'm old enough to have been around in the 1960s, and this was really like the best of the 1960s coming back to, it's just really refreshing uh, to see. Um, so the six most irresistible words in the English language are, let me tell you a story. Um, so let me tell you a story uh, about Union City, New Jersey. Um, some of you know Union City, yeah? Uh, six miles away from um, downtown Manhattan, and it's a social light year away. This is a town almost entirely Latino. They estimate about a third of the people living there are undocumented. Um, its poverty rate is twice that of the state. Its unemployment rate is twice that of the state. Housing is the most crowded in the state, not because there are high rises, but because you have families living three and four families to an apartment, each with a separate in a bedroom, locked door, and a shelf in the refrigerator. So these are, these are families, and 75% you know, <laughs> of, the, of the kids are coming to school, families speaking Spanish and not English at the dinner table. This is the telenovela, you know, not the soap opera. This is football, not football. <coughs> these are the kids who our schools generally fail. And we fail as a society because of that. And here's why you want to listen to this story. So Union City, in Union City, the graduation rate is 90%. Okay? 90%. It's higher than the national average. And 75% of those kids start college. So that's, you know, that's, I spent a year hanging out in Union City, trying to figure out what the secret sauce was. Um, and I had a, basically a passport to go any place I wanted. I spent a lot of time in a third grade classroom of Latino kids who were learning English while they were prepping for the first big high stakes exam. I was Mr. David in that class. Um, eight and nine year old Latino kids are really affectionate. It got, I, I said every day as they mobbed me when I'd come in, I'm probably violating 27 you know, New Jersey statutes in terms of no contact <laughs> with kids. Um, you know, and I, so I spent time with them and with an astonishing teacher who I write about named Alina Bosbali. And then in the school and in the principal's office, and I'd walk into the superintendent's office and sit on school board meetings and hang out with the mayor, who is this really interesting character who I describe as part Mayor Daly, part Mother, Ter <coughs> excuse me, Mother Teresa, an interesting combination of, uh, of, of people, looking for that secret sauce. But I knew I wasn't going to find the secret sauce, because what I found that the good part of the story, the easy part of the story is everything Union City does is known to any educator with a pulse. Nothing fancy. It's all familiar stuff. And the tougher part of the story is you got to keep at it. You got to keep at it day, month, year after year. You got to keep looking for improvements at the margin, figuring out what you can do better. You got to keep focusing on that. So what does Union City do? Let me just run down the list of things really quickly. And it's not like you can pluck off one of these things and say, gosh, if we do this. We have really good early education, which is the first thing I'll mention. That's it. You know, I, my heart is with the little kids. But you just can't stop there. And that's, I, I fear, what happens when there's too much of a focus on preschool. But great preschool program, a really strong bilingual program, because again, these kids are coming to school, most of them not speaking English. And they, they move from a Spanish-speaking environment, because linguists will tell you, you've got to understand and know you're be fluent in your first language before you can transition to another. Otherwise, you'll never really fully grasp English. Um, and they don't move as a batch. They move depending on where they are. Their classrooms assignments are based on how they're doing in English and how they're doing academically in particular subjects. So Alina had 17 students, which is fantastic. But she also had, I mean, four preps for every subject that she was dealing with depending upon, right, who the kids were. And you'd watch her do a ballet dance and switching languages and, and, and levels of work. Um, the teachers, we heard about this a second ago from Dana, the teachers collaborate. And that's how they learn. I ask these teachers, and I ask you, where did you learn to teach? Because you know, I, I first got interested in Union City because here's this place. You know, the reputation of urban schools is all the dozy teachers who were just doing nothing. And I, you know, they weren't there. They were, when I went randomly looking around the school the first day I was there, I saw a lot of solid teaching, I saw some great teaching, and I saw some teaching I'd really like to make a documentary of. Fantastic folks. How did you learn? 
They learn from each other. And the one invitation to speak I turned down was from the Teachers Colleges Association because I must have talked to 50 teachers and asked that question. Not a one of them mentioned their college education. It's a mes there's, a message in, there's a message in there. It's a district that uses assessments a lot. You know, the quote reformers would have a field day with that. They'd start firing folks right, left, and center. Here what they do is they pinpoint the problems that kids are having and focus on those and they help teachers. You know, using mentors to help work with those questions. They bring in coaches. So if a teacher is having a problem, for example, with, with doing word problems in math, you get somebody to coach around that. If a teacher doesn't really get writing teaching because she's not very comfortable about writing, you get help with that. And you just watch the improvement in these, in these teachers. A lot of collaboration, a lot of support, a lot of family engagement. I mean, there were, on a rainy late September day, first parents not, I said, how many folks do you think are gonna come? It's the toughest neighborhood in this toughest town. 90% of the kids had somebody there, a mom, a dad, a tia, an abuela, somebody there. And the person who they really they cheered, it's the kind of place where the principal stands up and says, does anybody not speak Spanish? Right, okay, but five people didn't speak Spanish, so everything was bilingual. The community liaison person was the hero, the rock star, because she knew everybody in that community. She knew how to help those kids and those families, not just with education stuff, but with life things as well. And you had a system of supports for everybody in this world. You had a system that really combined high expectations and warmth, what I'd call respeto and abrazos. I'll tell you a little story about walking into an eighth grade math class. And, and if there are any eighth grade math class, math teachers here, please just close your ears for a second. Um, I was terrible at math and never really loved it. So I'm watching this nice woman in her mid-50s. She's got her back to the class, writing on the blackboard. I've just opened the door. It's, you, it's pin drop quiet in there. What's going on, I said to her afterwards. You know, how did this happen? Well, it turns out, she said, let me tell you a little bit of a story. Um, I had a, a new kid who arrived, and I heard noise in the back of the room. He was making fun of me, and the other kid said, shh, and they came up to me. Afterwards, this little contingent, and they said, Ms. Jones, Ms. Jones, we have your back. Now, I don't know about you, but I would never at age 14 have gone up to my math teacher and said, we have your back. It, you, don't, you don't just make that happen. It just doesn't happen automatically. It's sort of built and baked into that system. So after I left Union City, I knew people would say, that's a nice story, but it's all about that very special place. They've got a lot of money, they've got these model minorities, which isn't news to Latino kids, I'm sure, that they become a model minority. Um, so I went looking, you know, rich, poor, big districts, big, little districts, unionized, non-unionized, elected boards, appointed boards, any black, white, Latino, combination thereof, Asian, didn't matter. They were all doing the same kinds of things. They were not focused on charter schools. They're not firing a ton of teachers. Nobody uttered the word vouchers. Nobody was thinking that technology was going to replace what teachers were. They were all built on systems of support. They all understood that there's no substitute for building a set of relationships between talented teachers, engaged students, and a challenging curriculum. That there is no substitute. There's no way of avoiding what, as they talked about, is love. There's no way that you can avoid focusing on that trusting, caring relationship between grown-ups and kids. No shortcut for doing that. We have, a great, we have a great story to tell. We're not doing a great job of telling it yet. You know, the stage is occupied by people who are, you know, who are big on bashing folks. One of them seems to be running for president, sort of, from the state that I wrote about. Um, we won't mention his name here. Um, We've got to get the stories out. They're ours to tell. Thank you very much.